Well, here I am again, reviewing Disney's latest attempt to milk the Star Wars franchise for all it's worth. A dull protagonist, a disappointing finale, and a failure to develop the most interesting characters in the show make Ahsoka just one other mediocre installment in the Disney Star Wars canon. For all that, Ahsoka manages to not be completely unenjoyable, but the best elements it has to offer amount to nothing but nostalgia for Clone Wars and Rebels, and that is Ahsoka's biggest problem. Ahsoka tries to cash in on the low-effort, quick returns of fan service and nostalgic throwbacks, rather than putting in the hard work of fully developing its own characters and writing an internally consistent story. To demonstrate this, let's look at the premise for the show and talk about some of its flaws. Although the show is named Ahsoka, it functions more like a continuation of Star Wars Rebels, and picks up right where Rebel Season 4 ended. In the finale of Rebel Season 4, Ezra saves his home planet from the Empire by using the Force to communicate with space whales, telling them to grab Grand Admiral Thrawn's ship and jump through hyperspace to an unknown location. The plan works, but in order to pull it off, Ezra had to be on board Thrawn's ship, meaning that Ezra is exiled along with Thrawn. The final scene of Rebels shows Ahsoka Tano teaming up with Ezra's close friend and Mandalorian teammate Sabine Wren to try to find him. Now, the Ahsoka show begins several years later with Ahsoka back on the hunt for Ezra, only by now she and Sabine have had a falling out and are no longer working together. The surprising reason for this falling out is that Ahsoka actually took on Sabine as her Padawan, but walked out on her because she was afraid Sabine was trying to learn the ways of the Force for the wrong reasons. But when Ahsoka finds an encoded map that may lead her to Ezra, she's forced to go to Sabine for help, and the two have to learn to work together again so they can find him. But Ahsoka and Sabine are not alone in their hunt for Ezra. Also looking for the map are mysterious ex-Jedi Balin Skull and his apprentice Shin Hati. For reasons never clearly explained, they're searching for Grand Admiral Thrawn, and have teamed up with a survivor of the Knight Sisters, Morgan Elsbeth, in order to find him. The story is essentially a race to see which group can get the map and follow it to its end first, while doing everything they can to sabotage the other. It's a good idea for a show. The possibility of finding Ezra again, the risk of allowing Thrawn to return, and the mystery of Balin Skull and his allies all kept me interested and looking forward to in the next episode, and overall I had fun watching the show. But, as I said before, Ahsoka certainly has its share of problems. First, the plot is completely derivative of Star Wars Rebels, which means if you haven't watched Rebels, you're going to be completely lost when it comes to Ahsoka. I was able to enjoy this show because I liked Rebels and was already invested in characters like Ezra and Sabine, but if you don't already have a relationship with them, there's just not a lot to enjoy here. This wouldn't be too much of a problem if Ahsoka made more of an effort to redevelop Rebels characters for new viewers, but it makes no attempt to do that. If you want to know why Thrawn is so dangerous, or who Ezra is, you're just going to have to watch Rebels. It's hard for me to imagine how anyone who isn't already invested in Rebels can understand or enjoy Ahsoka, which is ironic since the show is supposed to be about Ahsoka, not Rebels. Another big problem is the whole idea of Sabine becoming a Jedi. It's like Luke taking Han Solo as his first apprentice. It just doesn't fit her character. In four seasons of Rebels, Sabine never showed even a hint of Force sensitivity or any desire whatsoever to train in the Force. It's so out of character for her that the show has to acknowledge Sabine's ineptitude so that it doesn't seem completely ridiculous. I have known many Padawans over the centuries, and I can safely say your aptitude for the Force would fall short of them all. But Ahsoka really tries to have its cake and eat it too on this point, explicitly stating that Sabine has the worst potential of any Jedi in the past several hundred years, but also letting her hold her own in lightsaber duels with Shin Hati and using the Force in ways that are pretty impressive for an amateur. First of all, lightsaber duels are not merely fencing matches. Force wielders use the Force to guide their movements and predict their opponent's attacks. Aside from absolute monsters like General Grievous, Non-Force users shouldn't be able to compete with a trained Jedi, because the Jedi should be able to predict and block their every move. Chin may have thrashed Sabine in their first fight, but the fact that Sabine is able to hold her own for a bit, and even bring their second fight to a draw, just isn't consistent with her abilities. Now add to this that the first time Sabine successfully uses the Force is to pull her lightsaber to her hand when her life is in danger, mirroring Luke Skywalker, 
and her second time using the Force is to throw Ezra several hundred feet into the air. The show has to insist that Sabine has no talent for consistency's sake, but the story demands that she be a prodigy. It just doesn't work. I could also complain about how her liver and right kidney get punctured by a lightsaber, yet she recovers in what seems to be only a few hours, but I've already discussed that issue at length in my Obi-Wan video, so if you want to see me rant about lightsaber stabbing suddenly becoming non-lethal, check out that video. Tis but a, scratch. a bigger problem for me is Ahsoka herself. In my last video, I explained why I have never cared about Ahsoka as a character, but even at her best in Clone Wars Season 7, Ahsoka is at least interesting. But now, in her own show, she's one of the most dull protagonists I've ever seen. Every time she's on screen, she seems bored out of her mind. It feels like Rosario Dawson was trying to give Ahsoka an air of stoic wisdom and maturity, but she comes across as either disinterested, annoyed at everything around her, or emotionally stunted through enough antidepressants to knock out a horse. Contrast her with Ray Stevenson, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Stevenson's portrayal of Balin Skull dominates the screen in every scene he appears in. His character is dripping with gravitas and presence. For some reason, the wise, stoic mentor archetype just doesn't work with Ahsoka, and I can't tell if it's because Rosario Dawson doesn't know how to portray that kind of character, or because the writing and directing were all wrong. Of course, it doesn't help matters that Ahsoka is completely outmatched by Balin Skull in combat. This comes as quite a surprise to me, since by the end of Clone Wars, Ahsoka is powerful enough to fight off hundreds of clone troopers while trapped on a Star Destroyer. So how is it that this ex-Jedi we've never heard of before became powerful enough to outclass Anakin Skywalker's Padawan. He's seriously so much better than her that she stops trying to beat him. You can't defeat me. Perhaps. I don't have to. I would expect them to be evenly matched at least, but Ahsoka seriously can't hold a candle to him. Speaking of Balin Skull, he was by far the most interesting character in the show. Unfortunately, he's also one of the least developed. What is his relationship with the dark side and light side of the Force? How did he survive the Purge, and why did he walk away from the Jedi path? What is his final goal, and why does he decide to abandon Thrawn and Shin? The show teases at answers to some of these questions, but by the time the finale ends, we still don't know any more about him than we did in Episode 1. He's like a perpetual mystery box that will never be opened no matter how long you wait. The same is true for Marok the former Inquisitor who is also working with Skull, Hati, and Elsbeth. Early in the show, there was a lot of fun speculation about his identity, with some even suggesting he might be Starkiller from the Force Unleashed games. But Ahsoka kills him, and we don't get even a hint of his identity, his past, or how he ended up working with Balin Skull. The two most interesting characters in the show get almost no treatment, which is part of the reason why the finale was so underwhelming. Now, all of these are problems that could have been solved with better writing and a more well-thought-out plot. The real problem with Ahsoka is its dependence on nostalgia instead of good writing. Don't get me wrong, nostalgic impact and fan service can be a great addition to any show. I mean, I think it's awesome how they recreated the final scene from Rebels. But a story that depends on nostalgic power over good writing is like getting a new paint job on a car without an engine. Once the nostalgia wears off, there's nothing for the story to hide behind, and it won't stand on its own unless it's built on stronger foundations than Easter eggs and fan service. Ahsoka Episode 5 is a perfect example of this. It's the highest rated episode on IMDb by a good bit, with fans calling it Star Wars at its finest and praising Dave Filoni as the greatest of all time. Now, if you're a fan of The Clone Wars, there's a lot of fan service to enjoy in this episode. Hayden Christensen returns to play Anakin in his Clone Wars getup, Ahsoka relives moments from throughout the Clone Wars show, and we even get to see a live-action version of Captain Rex. However, the plot of this episode is a complete mess. At first, it seems like Ghost Anakin has pulled Ahsoka into the realm of space and time in order to save her life, much like Ezra did in Rebels Season 4. But Anakin doesn't act like a Force ghost at all transitioning fluidly between Clone Wars-era Anakin and Darth Vader. So is this ghost Anakin, or is this just a projection from Ahsoka's own mind? Did Anakin save her, or is all this just a near-death experience? We don't know, and as the critical drinker aptly said in his own review, Dave Filoni probably doesn't know either. 
During this vision, or whatever it is, Ahsoka struggles with the morality of the Clone Wars and the failures of the Jedi Order, which seems more like something she would have struggled with at the time, not something she'd be struggling with now as a veteran of both the Clone Wars and the Rebellion. She also seems to struggle with her identity as the apprentice of the man who became Darth Vader, which also seems like a strange thing to struggle with considering she knows about Vader's redemption. Yet, her vision offers no solution to either of these struggles. Instead, Anakin drills into her a lesson that is completely unrelated to anything she's going through. Fight or die, he repeats several times, as if Ahsoka had been on the verge of giving up and needed to be reminded to keep fighting. This is simply not a lesson Ahsoka needs right now. We've seen no hint that she's giving up hope or losing motivation to fight. The lesson she really needs at this point is to trust Sabine and let go of her fear that Sabine will turn bad. Regardless, Ahsoka chooses to live, whatever that means, and wakes up from the vision without having actually learned anything or changed in any way. Seriously, you could skip this entire episode and cut straight from Ahsoka falling off the cliff to her waking up in the water at the bottom, and it wouldn't disrupt the flow of the plot at all. It's just a contrivance to insert a lot of fan service without actually contributing anything to the story. By the way, Mahler did an excellent in-depth analysis of this episode that really helped me understand why it doesn't work. I'll post a link to it in the description. The point is, nostalgia is the only thing that keeps Ahsoka entertaining, whether it's Clone Wars or Rebels-era nostalgia. And that doesn't bode well for Ahsoka Season 2, whenever it comes out, or for the future of Disney Star Wars as a whole. It was fun for a little while, but it's already being forgotten. As always, if you made it this far and liked what you heard, please help me out by liking, subscribing, and sharing with a friend. And thanks so much for watching. It really does mean a lot.